always good to come back to Moralton. I feel like I, I'm, I'm blessed and fortunate to come every summer. I think last year was kind of the, uh, the odd year, but you know what? This year's turning into an odd year too. But what I remember last year is the invitations to speak other places were all done by video except here. You guys let me come and do it live, and I so appreciated that. So it's just nice to have a little bit of um, normalcy, I guess, in the midst of everything. I know it's a difficult time. I know it is, and it, it seems like this is never going to, to end, but uh, this is a time when, when God's people have got to keep praying and trusting in Him, don't we? And, um, and just press on. So, April the 12th this year, I had surgery. I've never had surgery in my entire life, I had surgery. And I remember going in to see the doctor. Uh, prior to the surgery, weeks before, and he said, yeah, he looked at me, checked things out, he said, yeah, this is what we got to do, you got nerves being pinched back here, and it's affecting your arm, and we're, we got to do the surgery, and I said, okay, and he, this is what I expect, this is what's going to happen, this is how you should feel after it, this is what recovery, the whole nine yards, and then he said this right before I left, he said, I want to know something from you, I said, okay, he said, are you going to go home and look this surgery up on YouTube and watch it? And I said, I promise you, I'm not even tempted to do that. I, there are some things I don't need to know and I don't need to see. You're, you're the professional. I trust you. You're going to do what you need to do. But here's the thing. We live in a time when everyone wants to be in the know about everything and everyone. And that's how social media is, isn't it? If we want to know something, well we, well, we can jump on Facebook and see what's going on. We've got a... In our neighborhood, back home in Cabot, we have a Facebook page for our neighborhood. If there's a strange vehicle that goes through, guess what? It makes it on Facebook, and we know about it. If someone, you know, if, if there's a break-in, and some of it's positive, some of it's good, it's good to know these things. But my point is, we want to know everything today. There's not just one tabloid magazine, there are countless tabloid magazines and countless websites so that anybody can go and dig up all the dirt they want to find on their favorite celebrity from how, how they dress to where they live and how big their mansion is to, to the, the kind of diet they practice even. You can find it out if you try hard enough. Our society today wants all the information what it is, what it does, how it works, we Google it, don't we? If we're, if we're sitting at the table and someone says, well, what about this? And we don't have the answer, we'll Google it and we'll find the answer. Well, well I'm not sure about fixing this thing on my house. Well, I'll tell you what, instead of bringing someone in, why don't you YouTube it, right? It's a different time. And we have nearly all of the answers at our fingertips. If Google doesn't have it, there's got to be a YouTube presentation that will. Then comes our topic tonight. You have dug into deep theological questions this summer, and I, I looked over them this morning, uh, the different questions you had, glanced at a few of them. It's just amazing what you've talked about. This is a summer series like no other that I've been familiar with. And when George called me and said, here's your topic. This is what I want you to discuss. How can Jesus be both fully human and fully God? And I laughed. And I said, really, what's my topic, George? And he said, that's it. He said, I saved that one for you. And I said, man, I sure appreciate it. So as we dig into this topic tonight, I want us to begin. And, and folks, I've got a lot of scriptures to go through. So I'm going to encourage you ahead of time, write them down. Try to keep track with me uh, if you can. Uh, jot them down, take some notes, wh whatever you need to. But as we look at this topic of how can Jesus be both fully human and fully God, we've got to look at Isaiah 40 and have this scripture, this text in mind as we dig into this. Isaiah 40 and verse 28 says, have you, have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth, he does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. And then in chapter 55 of Isaiah, Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, I just want this lingering in your mind as we delve into this tonight. 8 and 9, Isaiah 55. For my thoughts 
are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And we're asking the question, how can Jesus be both fully human and fully God? I've been preaching for 20-something years, and I want you to know, I'll be straight honest with you, I did not have this sermon in any of my files. Nor have I preached on anything like this in 20-something years. Maybe that's kind of a confession and repentance. Because digging into this, I've learned so much, so I hope I can take you on a little journey tonight. And I, I hope that, that you're challenged. I hope you learn a few things and, and maybe some, some more things are reinforced for you. Three things I want to share with you over the next few minutes. And the first thing, I want to talk about a word that we don't use a whole lot, the Trinity. Sometimes we say Trinity. Sometimes we say Godhead. I think some are more comfortable with Godhead. Some are more comfortable with Trinity. Let's don't get lost in, in the, the words, though, okay? Let's don't. Let me, let me tell you what the word Trinity means. The teaching of the Trinity says that God is one being. God is one being. Um, The one God exists in three distinct persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So he's one being, but he exists in three distinct persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that's not odd for you. You've heard this. You've studied this. You've read this. Okay, this is not unfamiliar to you. The Great Commission makes reference to the Trinity. Jesus would say, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, right? He makes reference to the Godhead. He makes reference to the Trinity. And see, here's what I want you to get from this as we're laying some groundwork. There are, they are each distinct, yet they all have the same divine nature and are one being. So three distinct individuals that make up one being. Is your mind shot yet? Well, just really put the seatbelt on and go with me. This is fun. Each is fully and equally divine, so all three persons are each fully and equally God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Now, let me say this. Divinity is not split between the three of them so that the three are each one-third God. They are all equally, fully God. And maybe maybe these are some things you haven't quite thought about. And so maybe there will be some things that will challenge you a little bit tonight. I'm okay with that. I think that's... That's healthy. If I I drive into town, challenge you a little bit, get you to study it a little bit, that's fantastic. If you got any questions, ask George when he gets back. He's in, uh, he's going to watch this. I love George. George is is preaching in Hebrew tonight, so uh, he couldn't be here. I would have loved to have seen him and Gail, but I dearly love them. We go back many years, as you know, and I know he he does a great work here for you. Genesis chapter 1, I love this verse. Genesis 1 and verse 26 and 27 actually says this. Then God said, let us, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Did you hear that? Let us. He didn't say let me or I will make man in my image. He said let us make man in our image. Image. So what's he talking about? The us and the hour speaks of the Godhead, speaks of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Very much a part of this. So let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have domination, or excuse me, dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the, uh, of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Listen, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him, male and female. He created them. So you've got in the one verse, us and our, and then it says God created them. So there's three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Spirit, but make up 
that make up the one God. I, I want to stress this. They're not each one-third God. They don't share the, the divinity. They are each 100% God. They were with God and a part of, uh, or all with God and a part of the creation process. In John chapter 1, and I told you, if you can't keep up with me, uh, my wife says I go very, very fast when I'm on a topical sermon and I have several scriptures. If you can't keep up, write them down. Go back and read them later if you want. John 1, starting in verse 1, says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So you've got Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinity. They're all equally God. All three persons make up the one being God. They're all God, and they were all part of God. The creation process. Okay, I just want to lay that foundation uh, as we move on. All right, secondly, let's talk about some proof that Jesus is both fully human and fully God. Let's, let's, let's prove that, okay? I think there's sometimes there's some misconceptions. Maybe you're going, you know what? This is a no-brainer. This is obvious. Well, there's a spot in here where I think people tend to get lost. And, and I want us to kind of work our way through that if we can. So let's talk about proof that Jesus is both fully human and fully God. Incarnation, that teaching says, the second person of the Trinity, which we just talked about, assumed human form in the person of Jesus Christ and is completely, completely both God and man. That's what the, incarna the teaching of incarnation says. Jesus became man, and he's both God and man. That's really kind of hard to wrap our mind around. I can understand one or the other. I can get that. You're either a second baseman or, or an outfielder. <laughs> I get it. You play offense or defense, I follow. But when we start mixing it, and we're saying Jesus is both human and God. That's where it gets a little foggy at times. Okay, dive in with me, shall we? In Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2, look on your little device or in your Bible. Luke 2 and verse 7 says this. This is a familiar verse for you. It says, and she, Mary, gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the end. We tell that story to our, our little ones, don't we? I mean, that's a, that's a perfect story for VBS, or it's a perfect story for the, for the holidays, but it's a great, great, wonderful story. The way Jesus was born, there was, there was no place for him in the, in the hotel, in the inn, so he has to stay in this manger. But what I want you to see is the obvious, and that's that Jesus was born of a woman like you and me. Galatians 4 and verse 4 says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law. So Jesus was born of a woman, born of Mary, just like you and me. And that says he's 100% man. He's absolutely, without a doubt, flesh and blood. He was born... He was born like we were born. You say, yeah, but what about the virgin birth? We're, we'll get to that. Let's, let's take it a step at a time, shall we? We'll get there. He was born like us. I remember the birth of my kids. You should, some things you don't forget. Some people have asked me over the years, did you take pictures? I didn't need to take pictures. I really didn't. Um, we, we have some pictures of our kids, but not at that particular time. I, anyway. Um, <laughs> I didn't feel that appropriate, and uh, so we didn't do that. But anyway, uh, I remember those three uh, days and uh, one uh, early morning, and I remember those times. Little bitty babies, but flesh and blood like me. 
little bitty babies, but born just like me. That's Jesus. Absolute 100% human being, flesh and blood. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 2. 1 John 4 and verse 2 says, by, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. He definitely came in the flesh. He was born. How could he, how could he only be God, divine, and, and not human if he was born? That proves, his birth proves that he was definitely flesh and blood human. All right, 2 John 2, or not 2 John 2, 2 John verse 7 says, For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who, who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. But he's saying Jesus most certainly came in the flesh, and we know that he did because we've seen he, we know his birth story. We know the name of his mom. We even know the name of his stepdad who raised him. We understand 100% flesh and blood. Let me show you a few more things. In Matthew chapter 8, Jesus, the humanity of Jesus is seen in how he became tired and weary. You ever get tired? I know you do. I know you do. You work all week and you think, well, football season's starting. We're going to go, we're, we're going to go watch the, the Bulldogs. How do you miss that? My apologies. I knew they were dogs, though. Uh, we're going to go watch the devil dogs Friday night, and Friday night rolls around. You say, oh, I'm just so tired. I've worked all week, long days. I don't know if I can sit in those stands tonight. Because we do. We wear down. We get tired, and that's, that's the flesh. That, that's our humanity. Well, in Matthew 8, 23 and 24, it says, When he got into the boat, you know this story, his disciples followed him, and behold, there, were, there arose a great storm on the sea so that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. And we know the story that Jesus, they wake him, they're scared, the, they're going to sink and drown, and Jesus wakes up, hush, quiet, be still, and it does. But what I want you to pull from that story is something that we overlook often. He was tired. He got into a boat and slept and would have slept through the storm. They had to wake him during the storm. He is exhausted. He's been healing people. He's been teaching. He's been, you know, dealing with all the things that he dealt with from, from sun up to sundown. He's exhausted just like you and me. And you say, well, I can relate to that. I have days like that, right? What about John chapter 4 and verse 6? John 4 and verse 6. It says, Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. So Jesus has been traveling, and he, he sees the well. He sits down. He wants a drink. He wants to rest. He's tired. He's weary. Anybody ever, ever climb Pinnacle Mountain? Anybody ever go for a walk in the evening? Maybe you're not now because it's like 109 at 5 o'clock, isn't it? But when you do those exercises, when you hike that mountain or you walk around the block or go walk the track and get your, get your couple miles in, guess what? You get tired. So when we read this about Jesus, I hope it helps you relate to him because he can certainly relate to us. Tired, that shows his humanity, born of a woman just like you, just like me, but he got tired just like we do every single day. Never do I come home and, and 10, 11 o'clock at night do I say to my wife, I'm just not tired. I'm just not tired. I think I'll just stay up tonight and, and go ahead and go to work in the morning. That has never happened. Can't do that. Why? Because I, I wear down and you do as well. And that's that's what we see in Jesus, the humanity of him. Matthew chapter 4, Matthew 4 verse 2 also shows us. This is, this is the temptation. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Isn't that quite a passage? 
Can you imagine fasting 40 days and 40 nights? Think you'll be hungry? That's an understatement. Yeah, you'll be starving. But Jesus was not only tired, not only grew weary, but he was hungry. He was hungry. And we get hungry. In Matthew 8, let me show you another one. We're building up to something here. Matthew 8 and verse 10, I like this one a lot. It says, when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. He marveled. You might marvel when you look out the window and you see it snowing in the wintertime. Or you might marvel in the springtime at the pretty flowers. Or you might marvel when you drive over the, the Arkansas River Bridge and you can look off in the distance to see Pinnacle Mountain. Are you with me? You've been over that bridge? You, you might marvel at things like that. And, and that's exactly what humans do. We're impressed with God's handiwork. And Jesus marveled. He understands that emotion. Shows the humanity of Jesus. And what about John 11 and verse 35? You remember that one? One of the shortest verses in the New Testament. Jesus wept. You remember the context? Lazarus died. His friend Lazarus died. Mary and Martha, Lazarus' sisters, boy, they're upset and upset with Jesus that he didn't hightail it over there and get there sooner so Lazarus wouldn't die. And Jesus weeps. He grieves. And I know you know what that's like. I feel like we've been doing a lot of grieving for nearly two years almost, haven't we? You don't know someone that's battled this stuff, this COVID stuff. You, you, more than likely you do know someone. And been a lot of grief. A lot of families hit hard by this. A lot of grief. And when we lose a loved one, when we go through these, these tragedies like this with Lazarus dying... We too grieve. I want to look at one more. In Luke 22, what a critical point in the life of Jesus. He's, it's the garden scene the night before the cross. In verses 43 and 44, well, let's back up, shall we? In verse 41, he withdrew with them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and he prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup. We know the cup to be the cross that he would endure the next day. He says, remove the cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. He was, he was in agony. He was stressed. He felt such great pressure because he was going to endure the cross the next day. I mean, the most stressful point in his life prior to those nails going through his wrists and his feet the next day. There's nothing we can go through that he can't relate to. In fact, Hebrews 4 and verse 15 says, We do not have a, a high priest, a priest who can't sympathize with us. Jesus has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Tempted just like us. So even when you're facing temptations and you're struggling and I, I don't want to do this, I shouldn't do this, but man, this will be fun. Jesus knows what that's like. He just didn't sin. He never gave in to the sin. And that takes us to the next part that I want to prove here. Definitely human, folks. He was born just like us. We've seen that, we had many of the same feelings and emotions. But Jesus wasn't always human. He wasn't always man. But he's always been God, and he never stopped being God. I've got to stress that. This is where I told you where it gets a little confusing for some. He never stopped being God. Philippians 2, let's look there for a minute. What time am I supposed to quit? Because 7.45, 7.50? Okay. That's good to know. Uh, Philippians 2, 5 and following. Let's see what he says. We, we know this text, don't we? 
He says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. He emptied himself. And I think some people say, okay, when he emptied himself, that's when the deity went out the window. That's when he threw deity away. There was no more deity. He was just Jesus the human there, and he was not God. Not true. Not true. Okay? This idea... Well, let's just read on, shall we? I kind of interrupted our, our flow there. Um, what verse was I? Verse 7. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross... Therefore God has highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So this idea of Jesus emptying himself it simply speaks of him leaving heaven. He, didn't, he did not empty himself of deity. He did not ever cease to be God. It's hard to wrap our mind around the fact that Jesus, he's both human and he's God at the same time. We want one or the other because we can kind of understand that better. So he empties himself when he comes to earth to to take on the form of a servant to die on a cross for you and me, but he never ceases to be God. Colossians 2, 9 will verify that for us. In Colossians 2, in verse 9, it says, For in him, in Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. So even while he walked the earth, he's full of deity. He's God. He's God. And if he's not, and you wrestle with that, how can he do some of the things that he did? How can he know the things that he knew? There's no explanation for the scriptures we're going to read in just a minute except the fact that he was 100% God. We've already seen he was 100% human, born just like me and you. He was also 100% God at the same time. Titus, let's look at some scriptures, okay? Titus 2, in verse 13, says, Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus is God. Paul writes to Titus, he's God. Back to the Gospel of John. John 20. Write these down if you can't keep up with me. John 20 and verse 28. Remember Thomas, oh doubting Thomas, remember him? He gets a bad rap sometimes. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. After he saw the, the nail marks, right? My Lord and my God. Jesus is God. John chapter 1 and verse 18. says, no one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made Him known. Jesus is God. No question. 100% man, but also 100% God. I want to look at a few more. And then we're going to get to the question that is really our assignment tonight. But let's look at a few more. A little more proof if, if we can. Jesus has all the attributes of God. He, he knows everything. There's nothing that he didn't know. In, in John chapter 1, maybe you're still there. If you look with me in verses 47 and following, notice how this story plays out. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, and he said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. How do you explain that? 100% human? I can't do that. You can't do that. But he was also 100% God. God can do that. Are you with me? 100% human, but also 100% God. I know that's confusing. I know that scrambles our mind just a bit. 
But that's the truth of the matter. In John chapter 4, in verse 29, listen at the description of Jesus. Remember the woman at the well. And, and remember he told her, Jesus said in verse 10, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And the woman said, Sir, you, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. And where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself and as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. You remember this conversation and you remember what he says to her in verse 18. Jesus said, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you are right in saying, I have no husband for you have had Five husbands. Now, notice what he says to her, or excuse me, verses uh, 47 and following. Same chapter. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and I, Is that what I wanted to read? Let's try it again. So Jesus said to him in, in verse 48, Unless you see the signs and wonders, you will believe the... The official said to him, that's not what I wanted, guys. I'm, I'm, I'm losing my place here. I'm sorry. Well, has that ever happened to you? Verse 29. There it is, right in, right in front of me. The woman describing Jesus. I couldn't leave this out. I, I apologize about that. Uh, come see, she says to, to her people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? So after he describes, yeah, I know you don't have a husband. You've had five husbands and, and, and goes into this thing about living water and then she goes back to her people and says, hey, this guy told me everything about me. So Jesus, he, he knows everything. He has the attributes of God. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with him. He's everywhere, Matthew 18, 20. And lo, I am with you always to the end of the age, Matthew 28, verse 20. And in Matthew 8, he's, he's all powerful. In Matthew chapter 8, verses 26. And 27, this is the, the scripture we left off earlier. He said to them, why are you afraid? Remember the storm? He's asleep. They wake him. Oh, you of little faith. Then he rose and he rebuked the winds and the sea and there was great calm. What about John 11? The story we were talking about earlier. John chapter 11. 38 and following. Jesus deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes, and he said, Father, I thank you. That, I, that you have heard me, I knew that you always hear me. I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and his feet bound with linen strips. This is crazy. This is wild. Nobody can do this except God. 100% man. And 100% God. He, Jesus has all the attributes of God everywhere at once, all powerful. He can do anything. He's never, Jesus never began to exist, and He never will cease to exist because He's always been. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, John 1.1. 1, 1. Let us make man in our image. In our likeness, He's always been because He's God. In Colossians chapter 1, Colossians 1 in verse 16 says this, 
For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. Jesus. Born like us. 100% man, but 100% God. All of this means that everything God is, Jesus is, because Jesus Christ is God. I, I couldn't wait to say this. Jesus has two natures. You say, what? What? Wait a minute. What? You and I have one. It's a fleshly nature. Jesus had fleshly nature and a divine nature. Okay. 100% man, 100% God. No question. I think the Scriptures prove that. So, thirdly, let's get to our question. The question, the topic of the hour is, how can Jesus be both fully human and fully God? This is really the question we want to answer. This is really where we want to wrap things up. Just give me the answer. Let me go home, get a snack, watch TV. This is what we want, right? Let me tell you something. Mary had some incredible information dropped in her lap, didn't she? Incredible information. And yet she had a question. Luke chapter 1, 26 and following. Goes like this. In the sixth month, the angel... Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin, a virgin, betrothed, promised to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and he said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. That's a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot to have laid on you. What, what are you going to do with that? I know you're a virgin, but you're about to be pregnant. Doctors would look at each other today and kind of grin and say, that's impossible. And not just doctors, you and I would say the same thing. Because medically it's impossible. In verse 34, Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I'm a virgin? There's no way this can happen. Ain't Gabriel, don't you remember? I'm a virgin. How can this happen? Mary asked the same question that you and I are asking tonight. How can Jesus be both fully human and fully God? How can this be, she says. And the angel answered her in verse 35. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Now, let me, let me give you a little insight here. Anytime you see in Scripture the phrase, or in the New Testament, the Spirit came on someone or the Spirit fell upon them, miraculous activity always follows. And so she's saying, how? I'm a virgin. How's this going to happen? You and I are going, How? How can Jesus be both fully human and fully God? How can this happen? And did he give a thorough answer? Well, he basically said this. God's power will make it happen. Do you understand how that happened? Do you understand how the virgin could be made pregnant? We understand the birth process. We got that. How can she be made pregnant, though? How? God made it happen. So, as we ponder this question, how can Jesus be both fully human and fully God? <coughs> By God's power. He can do absolutely anything. And listen, listen. We don't have to understand it. 
We don't have to understand it to go to heaven. Okay? And, and I'm a little relieved by that. In fact, I'm a lot relieved by that. In fact, I'm not sure we can wrap our mind around it totally. But our faith says it is so. Because we believe God, we believe the Bible is His holy word, and we believe what the Scriptures say, that Jesus was born of a virgin, just like you and I were born of a woman. He was 100% man and 100% God. How could He not be 100% God doing the things that He did? Maybe, let's, let's end with this. Maybe a better question tonight, is, is, a better question than how can Jesus be both fully human and fully God, maybe the better, better question is why. Why? I think I can address that one. Why is Jesus both fully human and fully God? Let me share a few more scriptures and we're going to quit. Uh, I know we're getting close and I don't want to wear out my welcome because I do like coming here. But let me share a few more things. Jot these down. Check them out. Hebrews 2, 17 and, and 18. I'm going to speed through her. How, or, or not the how, but the why. Sorry. Why could Jesus be both fully human and fully God? To pay the price for our sins. To help us when we're tempted. Hebrews 2, 17 and 18 says this. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers, that's you and me, in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God to make propitiation for their sins, to stand in their place, in the place of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. Aren't you glad? He was tempted. He didn't fall. He didn't sin. But he understands when you and I are tempted. Perfect high priest. How can he understand that unless he was 100% man and experienced temptation? Why, though? Well, that's why. So that he can understand what we've gone through and understand what we do go through. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and following, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He's spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. He is the radi radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature, and He upholds the universe by the word of His power. After making, listen, after making purification for sins... He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Let me ask you something. When you go out on Saturday and you mow the yard and you weed eat it and you finish, what do you do? I sit down. Why? Because the work's done. When Jesus finished his work, when he, after, the, after the crucifixion and He ascends to be in the resurrection, He ascends to be with the Father, He sits down at the right hand because the work was done. So, so why, why this fully human, fully God thing? So that He can understand all that we went through and go through and so that He could be the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Colossians, I've got just a few more and I'm hurrying, I promise. Colossians 1, 18 through 20. And He, Jesus, is the head of, of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from among the, the dead, that in everything He might be preeminent. For in Him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of His cross. 100% man, 100% God for the cross, for redemption. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Why 100% man and 100% God? The cross, redemption, the shed blood, forgiveness. And one more. 1 Peter chapter 2, we're going to end with this. In verse 24 says this, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree 
that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By His wounds you've been healed. So why 100% man and why 100% God? For the cross, for redemption, forgiveness, so that you and I could be in Christ, so that you and I could have the hope of eternal life. But the how. Preacher, that's what we're talking about. How can he be both fully human and fully God? I believe that's probably closer to a mystery than the why. I know that he is fully human and fully God. The how. God can do what he wants to do, folks. And maybe you're going, wow, we got ripped off tonight. George, you should have given this topic to someone else, maybe. I don't know how else to explain it. I'm not sure the how. I'm not sure that my mind is capable of understanding the how. But I'm so thankful that I know the why. And it has, it has everything to do with your redemption and my redemption. That's what it's all about. This evening... If you are subject to God's invitation, if we can help you here in a physical way or a spiritual way, uh, whatever your need might be, we would ask you to come as we stand and as we sing together.